Good evening and welcome to the Hewitt-Solia Federation of America's webinar on pain entitled, Ouch, Does It Always Have to Hurt? I um, just want to briefly introduce myself. My name is Sandra Wills and I am a program coordinator with Hewitt-Solia Federation of America. Also on the line tonight is Michelle Berg, our program director. Um, and we just want to thank you for attending and give you a couple of tips uh, before our speakers get started. So tonight's webinar will last approximately one hour. Uh, we welcome your participation and questions. However, your audio will be muted by our webinar system for the duration, um, as this helps eliminate any background noise that may disrupt the presentation. If you have a question, we encourage you to use the question box on the bottom right of your control panel that will show up on the right-hand side of your screen. I will then pass along these questions to our speakers. Throughout tonight's presentation, there are several poll questions. When the questions appear on your screen, you will have the opportunity to answer those questions anonymously, and then we will share the audience's feedback. And finally, HFA would like to acknowledge Nova Nordisk and AHF for their support of our family's program that helps make tonight's webinar possible. Um, as I said, the title of tonight's webinar is Ouch, Does It Always Have to Hurt? And our presenters include Laura Jean Siggins and Erica Mora. Laura Jean is the Clinical Co Nurse Coordinator at the University of Michigan Hemophilia and Coagulation Disorders Program, their Hemophilia Treatment Center. Laura Jean has been a nurse at the University of Michigan Hospital and Health Systems for 24 and a half years in pediatrics and has been with the HTC at the U University of Michigan for 13 years. She acquired her Master's of Nursing at the University of Phoenix in 2005 and her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from the University of Michigan School of Nursing. Laura Jean developed a port manual for families and staff and has, has presented at multiple local, state, and national organizations. She believes that education is essential to patients and their families so that they can make wise decisions regarding their diagnosis and treatment plans. She is also part of her hospital's POKE program initiative that helps decrease and eliminate pain from so many POKEs and procedures. And our second speaker is Erica Mora. Erica is a clinical pharmacist specializing in pediatric hematology and oncology at the University of Michigan C.S. Mott Children's Hospital and is an adjunct clinical instructor for the College of Pharmacy. She earned her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Georgia in 2007. She completed two years of postgraduate residency at the Northeast Georgia Medical Center in the Mayo Clinic and has been in her current role as an inpatient clinical pharmacist for the past five years. So with that, um, again, we welcome your feedback through the control panel questions and participation in the poll, and I'll hand it off to Laura Jean and, and Erica. Thank you, ladies. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Okay. All right. So welcome, everybody. So the objective today is we're hoping that by the end of this webinar that you will have a good um, ability to describe pain, pain thresholds, and when to treat your pain. We're hoping that you'll be able to discuss what common drugs are used in bleeding disorders and pain management, and hoping that you gain an understanding of how to navigate access to pain management interventions with your hemophilia treatment center. So at first, we want to look at the differences between acute and chronic pain. So according to Webster's definition, acute is having a sudden onset. It's sharp. It has a, a sharp rise and a short course being. It's felt, it's perceived, it's intense, demands urgent attention, whereas chronic is always present. It's, it's especially constantly vexing and weakening or troubling. It's marked by a very long duration or, or recurrent um, frequency. So with acute pain, we know that as hemophilia patients, when you have an injury, the most important goal is to treat as soon as possible. And this should be either immediately or within the hour. Whereas with chronic um, pain, sometimes it's hard for hemophilia patients to decipher between pain and a bleed. However, treating with factor might be changed up a little bit where you might treat around the clock, like every 6 or 8 or 12 hours um, at the very beginning in hopes that we eliminate any buildup of blood in that um, area. And then we'll add pain medications and other non-pharmacy treatments. But remember, if not treated early or appropriately, it will affect whether you can go to work or school. So you may need to use assistive devices such as wheelchairs, walkers, and crutches in that first um, several days or a week when you have um, some issues. 
Now, Erica is going to take over and talk about the pharmacy type medications and treatments. Thank you, Laura Jean. Um, so to start off this section on medication management of pain, I want to quickly review the pain pathways. Um, don't get bogged down with everything in this slide. It's intended to be a visual so that when we talk about the pain meds and how they work, we can refer back to this process and hopefully give you guys a better understanding of why we use certain agents and when we use them. So the first step in the development of normal pain, which is also called nociceptive pain, involves painful stimuli leading to excitation of primary sensory neurons. Several different mediators like arachidonic acid, cyclooxygenase, and prostaglandin are highlighted here. And those are associated with the activation of this peripheral nerve transmission, which is the first step of pain. And we're going to talk more about those mediators later. Once activated, the pain signal is sent to the spinal cord. It is here that additional mediators come into play, such as GABA and opioid receptors. Then the pain signal is quickly relayed up into the brain stem. Once the pain signals reach the brain, the perception of pain occurs. This is an incredibly complex event where the patient is able to become consciously aware of the painful event, as well as the ability to localize the origin of pain. The prostaglandin pathway is again involved centrally within the brain, as well as opioid receptors. And finally, modulation of the pain response occurs through the descending pathways, where signals can either be inhibited by neurotransmitters such as serotonin, which I have abbreviated as 5-HT, or norepinephrine, and endorphins, or the signals can be enhanced. And I just put a little fun fact that the word endorphin comes from the combination of the words endogenous, which means from within, and morphine. So it stands for natural chemicals that our bodies can release to help alleviate the feeling of pain. So now that we know about the pain pathway, the best management is to avoid it altogether by treating the underlying problem. If you can get rid of what's causing the problem, then obviously the pain should go away. In the case of hemophilia, we all know that it's impossible to just completely get rid of the underlying problem. So the question is, what are we going to do about the pain when it does occur? For the purpose of this talk, I want to focus on two main categories of pain medications that can be utilized to treat pain in hemophilia. The first broad category that we will discuss are the non-opioid analgesics, including Tylenol and NSAIDs. These agents can be really effective for treating mild pain, which I referred to in this slide as the lighter pink color. We'll also talk, talk about opioids or narcotics. This group of medications can be combined with non-opioid analgesics to treat moderate pain or given by itself in escalated doses to treat more severe pain. I symbolize moderate pain in this middle pink color and severe pain in this more intense red color. And this will be the theme used in later slides. I also will talk about adjuvant therapies and how those can and should be utilized at any point in the pain cycle. So we've already said that hemophilia patients are at high risk for pain, that there are two broad pain um, medication categories that can be utilized. So how do doctors and patients, as well as family members, determine which medication or combinations are, pro are appropriate for patients? So I want to pull the audience and see what you guys have been using. OK, so we will launch uh, this poll for our audience. So the question is, what pain medications do you or your family member most commonly use at home to treat hemophilia-associated pain? And your selections are Tylenol, non-selective NSAIDs like ibuprofen, naproxen, and I'm not going to pronounce that last one right, so I'm just going to not say it. Um, co combination opioids plus non-opioids, Vicodin, Lorotap, or Percocet, an opioid like morphine, oxycodone, hydromorphone, or methadone, or other. So uh, our audience, you have about 30 seconds to answer that, and then we'll close the poll and see how we're doing. Okay, give it a 10 second countdown, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And it looks like um, we have 0% using Tylenol, 33% using non-selective NSAIDs, 30% using a combination opioid and non-opioid, and then 67% using an opioid. OK, so it seems like most patients are using either B, C, or D in a combination of those. OK. Correct. 
Okay. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. So we'll talk about how each of those can be utilized based off of our pain rating. Um, so the next thing that we'll talk about is, is the pain algorithm that I'm presenting here, which is the World Health Organization Pain Ladder Algorithm. Um, it's one of the most widely accepted algorithms for pain treatment, so that's what we'll focus on today. Um, but then we'll talk about the agents individually so you can mix um, what you've learned today with when you talk to your physicians about what's appropriate. Um, so the first thing that we'll talk about with the World Health Organization pain ladder algorithm is step one pain. Um, so step one pain is considered mild pain, and um, it's recommended for non-opioid analgesics, and so your Tylenol and your NSAIDs for the treatment of mild pain. Um, we'll talk specifically, again, more about these um, in the next couple of slides. And step two pain for this algorithm is mild to moderate pain. And this is when they recommend you use a non-opioid analgesic from step one plus an opioid analgesic. And then step three would be severe pain. And this is when it's recommended to use an opioid agent with intermittent Opioids is needed for additional pain relief if you're having breakthrough pain, as well as non-opioids can be used um, to intensify the effect of the opioid. Um, and as with all the other steps, you can consider abdomen therapy. And so kind of the whole goal for the pain ladder algorithm is pain should be classified and rated at the onset, and the appropriate therapy should be initiated based on this algorithm. If the prescribed treatment does not help relieve the pain, and you should theoretically move one step up the ladder to achieve better pain control. If you've already um, achieved step three, then what you should do is um, look at the doses and schedules of the opioids you're on and optimize those if they're not already optimized. If the current pain regimen is causing unwanted side effects and or signs of toxicity, then you would reduce your dose of the medications or move down one step. So I want to break down these steps from these agents, and we'll start with the non-opioid um, medication classes, which it sounds like a lot of you guys are using at home. Um, and these, again, are primarily utilized for mild pain. This is going to include your acetaminophen, aspirin, and NSAIDs. Um, and we'll talk about each of those agents and when you would use them. So to understand the differences in these agents, it's important to understand how they work. So I want to explain how they work through this diagram in green. So try to just stay with me and don't get too overwhelmed with it. I don't mean for it to be confusing. But basically what happens in the body when you um, have tissue injury is tissue injury releases phospholipids and arachidonic acid from your cells. And then you have this enzyme in your body called cyclooxygenase, which is called the Cox enzyme, um, which is responsible for breaking down arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. And so if you think all the way back to that first slide where I was talking, this whole pathway with phospholipids, arachidonic acid, and prostaglandins is very important. So there are two Cox enzymes that we're going to talk about that break down arachidonic acid, and they are responsible for causing inflammation, pain, and fever in the body. However, prostaglandins that um, are specifically formed from the Cox-1 enzyme are also responsible for good things in the body, such as protection of the gastric mucosa as well as platelet aggregation. And platelet aggregation is part of the body's mechanism to cause your blood to clot when you have bleeding. So in very simplistic terms, how this relates to our pain medications. The medications typically used to treat mild pain, so our non-opioids, work by inhibiting Cox enzymes. And so this is going to lead to decreased prostaglandin production, as well as a decrease in the normal actions of the prostaglandins. And so in more detail, aspirin and most NSAIDs, like ibuprofen, naproxen, and Toradol, they, those medications are going to work by inhibiting both of the Cox enzymes shown here in the green diagram. So you get reduction of inflammation and pain and fever, but you're also going to inhibit the good effects of the Cox-1 enzyme, which is going to put you at risk for gastric irritation, gastric irritation and increased bleeding. Because of this, these medications should be used cautiously in patients with hemophilia because there's a combined bleeding risk from having hemophilia plus inhibiting that COX-1 enzyme, and your risk for bleeding increases. So if non-selective NSAIDs are used, so aspirin, ibuprofen, um, and toradol, and naproxen, then it should typically be under the advisement of a physician who's well-versed in treating patients with hemophilia. In general, we don't like the use of aspirin because it irreversibly binds to platelets and inhibits them. Serious risk bleeding is very high. The other ones 
um, again, should be used cautiously under um, the treatment of a physician that's used to working in patients with hemophilia and weighing that pro and con risk of bleeding. Now, when we talk about celebrex or celecoxib, you'll notice the cox part in the middle of the word comes from inhibiting the cox enzyme. Um, so it's also considered an NSAID, but it is selective for only inhibiting the COX-2 enzyme. So that is why it can be used in hemophilia. This means that taking Celebrex stops a major source of pain and inflammation by selectively inhibiting COX-2, but you don't have the risk for gastric irritation and increased bleeding events because it has very, very little inhibition of COX-1. And then the other agent that it didn't sound like many of you guys were using that can be used for mild pain is acetaminophen or Tylenol. And the mechanism of action of Tylenol is actually not well understood, but it's also thought to work on inhibition of COX-2. So again, to just refresh with this pain pathway, um, you can see that prostaglandin synthesis is important for the original initiation of pain out in the periphery at the primary sensory neurons, but also within the perception of pain in the brain. And so Celebrex and your NSAIDs are going to inhibit the um, COX enzymes in both of these places. However, Tylenol is going to be a centrally acting medication. So it's only going to work at prostaglandin synthesis in the brain. Because it works centrally, it does not have the anti-inflammatory properties that you typically see with the other NSAIDs that are going to work peripherally. Okay, so we're going to skip step two of the pain ladder, which has the combined opioids and non-opioids, because we'll go to that last. Um, next, I want to go over pure opioid analgesic, which are used for the treatment of step three pain, which is also classified as moderate to severe pain. Um, again, I'm going to show how these medications work by using a diagram in the lower left of your slide. So pain here is shown traveling through one nerve into the next nerve, next nerve by crossing a gap, which is called a synapse and pain signals are able to reach across this gap due to release of neurotransmitters by the first nerve, and these neurotransmitters are absorbed by the second nerve. Your opioid drugs are going to produce pain relief by binding to opioid receptors on that first nerve, and then what happens when those bind to the receptors is it blocks the release of those neurotransmitters, and that is going to stop the transmission of pain. And so if we go back to our pain pathway, again, we can see that the primary location for opioid receptors is in the spinal cord and in the brain. So that's where it's going to inhibit the pain pathway for, um, for opioid receptors. So now to go back to step two of the pain ladder, when is it recommended to use both opioids and non-opioids in combination? From a pain pathway perspective, it makes sense to use both because the classes of agents work on different parts of the pain pathway. So we talked about peripherally and centrally. Because of this, adding an agent such as Tylenol to an opioid containing regimen can actually cause additive or intensified analgesia. The reason that this is a recommended treatment strategy for step two pain is because there are combination products available where the dose amount of the non-opioid and the opioid are fixed. So if this is going to be your Lortab product or your Percocet product, also in the slide written as hydrocodone plus Tylenol or oxycodone plus Tylenol. Um, so it may be necessary um, if you have, you can use Tylenol in combination with your other opioids in more severe pain, but in those situations it may be necessary to use single ingredient products because then you can take your recommended maximum amount of Tylenol and you can escalate the dose of the opioid if needed without exceeding the maximum dose of the non-opioid. We're going to talk about why that's important. All right, so let's get into non-opioid considerations. So now that we've discussed when it's appropriate to use each agent, as well as how these agents work, I want to get into some details for consideration for when you would like think about different things with each medication or drug class. This additional information will help you as a patient or family member be informed about the pain medications that are prescribed. So again, we're going to talk about our non-opioids first. Medications in this class have what we, we call a ceiling effect, which means that once you reach the maximum dose, you have also reached the maximum potential for efficacy. If you're going to continue to increase the dose, you would not achieve more pain relief, which is one of the reasons that these medications, when used by themselves, are, useful, are usually only helpful for mild pain. Another component of the ceiling effect is that the ceiling applies to the analgesia, but not to the side effects. So again, if you were to increase your dose beyond the recommended max, the risk for side effects increases. 
then I want to break down the three main classes of non-opioids that we talked about. So specifically, NSAIDs, we talked about those first. So our Advil, Aleve, our Toradol, et cetera. These medications, again, are going to inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2, which means that their use can lead to gastric irritation and stomach upset, as well as an increased bleeding risk. The FDA has, in fact, mandated that all medications in this class have what we call a black box warning, which is their highest warning level. And for drugs in this class, it is specifically for risk of gastrointestinal bleeding and cardiovascular risk. So to reiterate, hemophilia patients are already prone to bleeding. The use of these medications is controversial. Um, I'm not saying they're not really good drugs, but they should, the use should occur with a physician that is well-versed in treating patients with hemophilia and that can advise you guys on the risk of bleeding versus the pros of the pain relief. Um, and then I wanted to touch a little bit on max doses for all of these medications since there is a healing effect, but because there's so many um, different medications in the inside class, I didn't go into all of the max doses, but I did want to reiterate, because of the healing effect, you don't want to increase the dose beyond what is the max prescribed by your doctor. The next drug is the celecoxib. Again, this is more selective to inhibiting COX-2. Um, and many people with hemophilia have had success with this medication. There have been studies that have shown that patients um, with hemophilia who have taken celebrex have not only had a reduction in pain, but also have had a decrease in factor use, as well as relief of chronic synovitis. Um, because of its more selective inhibition of COX-2, the risk for gastrointestinal adverse events, as well as uncontrolled bleeding, is much lower for this medication than for non-selective NSAIDs. It is still an NSAID, though, so it still comes with a black box warning for cardiovascular and gastrointestinal events. Those of you who are old enough to remember when Biox was on the market, Biox was also a COX-2 inhibitor, um, but it was found to have increased cardiovascular problems associated with it, so heart attacks, high blood pressure, stroke, et cetera. And so it was removed from the market in 2004 because of these risks. Celebrex is also in that same drug class. And so similar warnings come with Celebrex. However, the patients that are at highest risk for these cardiovascular effects with Celebrex are patients that already have a prior history of heart disease or those who are at high risk for developing cardiovascular disease. And again, max dose for Celebrex should be what is prescribed to you by your doctor. And then finally, acetaminophen, so I want to touch on that one quickly. The biggest thing with acetaminophen is it's most notably harmful for the liver. So this is an increased risk in patients who already have liver disease or hepatitis, patients who drink a lot of alcoholic beverages, or those who are on other medications that can be harmful for the liver. Additionally, patients who have none of these above risk factors can still develop liver toxicity if they take more than the recommended dose of acetaminophen. The recommended doses for this are going to be no more than 4 grams in one day if you're taking it sporadically, or 2.4 grams if taking it on a daily basis. All right, I want to um, touch on specific things to note about opioids. Um, sounds like there 60-something percent of you guys are using some sort of opioid at home to help manage hemophilia pain. Um, so this is a large class with a lot of information in it. I've tried to you know, put diagrams and pictures in my slides, but I couldn't think of a lot of good pictures for this. So I'm going to talk through some tables and hopefully I keep, don't fall asleep on me. Um, so to begin with, with opioids, there's no ceiling effect. Um, so increasing the dose with opioids will provide increased analgesia. Um, if you're using an opioid and you don't think that you're getting good pain relief, you may not be dosing it high enough. Most of the opioids will provide pain relief at some point as long as you get the dose at an appropriate dose for that patient and for their pain. So the biggest thing to consider when you're increasing the dose to provide adequate pain relief is balancing the side effects. So certain side effects that occur with opioids. The first one let's talk about is constipation. All opioids will cause constipation because opioids directly inhibit normal functions of the intestines. This is a side effect that does not get better over time, and if anything, it gets worse. In patients who are taking opioids on a scheduled basis for more than a day or two, it's very important to initiate a bowel regimen using both a stool softener such as Colace and a laxative such as Cina or Miralax. Bulk laxatives and osmotic laxatives such as Metamucil and Lactulose can also be used, but it's really important if you decide to use those that you stay adequately hydrated for them to work properly. Sedation is another side effect with opioids. This is going to most frequently occur when opioids are initiated or if doses are being increased. 
And this can present as either simple fatigue or it can also include cognitive impairment. Symptoms of over-sedation do typically improve or completely resolve within five days to a week. However, if they do not resolve in a problematic, sometimes switching to a different opioid can be helpful. Respiratory depression is the most serious side effect of the opioids, and patients are at highest risk for respiratory depression if they have not been, an, have not been on opioids and then are given bolus IV dose opioids for urgent pain relief. Additionally, if patients are on other medications that can cause respiratory depression or they already have an underlying respiratory condition, this can increase their risk. Fortunately, patients do not usually have respiratory depression prior to achieving adequate pain relief, meaning you usually have to dose an opioid higher than what is needed for pain relief to get in problems from a respiratory standpoint. Additionally, respiratory depression is rare in patients who have been receiving opioids chronically unless there's a significant increase in their dose. Itching is a very pesky side effect of opioids um, that occurs much more frequently when opioids are given via an epidural or intraspinal injection. It is thought that this is caused by histamine release, so sometimes if this is a problem for you, antihistamines can be helpful. Often this is considered an adverse effect, not a true allergy. And then finally, I want to touch on nausea and vomiting, because this can occur in 10 to 40 percent of patients receiving opioids. Again, this is not considered an allergy to the medication. Gradual upward titration may alleviate the nausea and vomiting. If it's still severe, then sometimes medication management can help. The antiemetics that seem to be the most helpful with nausea and vomiting due to opioids are Compazine and Zofran. Keep in mind, if nausea and vomiting is due to slowing of the GI tract or constipation, Zofran is not going to be helpful because Zofran is also constipating. So if this is the case, an aggressive patient-appropriate bowel regimen should be employed. So these are just some of the highlights or side effects that can occur with opioids, and they're going to differ from patient to patient. Um, I will highlight this here, and then Laura Jean will also talk about the importance of keeping a diary and writing down what side effects the patient is experiencing from their medications, when these side effects occurred, how severe they were, what relieved the side effects, et cetera. This information can be critical in helping your physician determine if additional actions or changes in therapy are required. So I'm going to do one more poll question for my section before, um, before we go on. Okay, so I'm going to launch this poll right now. Um, and the question is, what ill-related side effect is the only one that does not improve over time? Um, and the options are sedation, respiratory depression, constipation, nausea and vomiting, or they all improve over time? Um, and it looks like a third of our audience has already answered. We'll give um, everybody else a minute here. So a 30 second countdown, or nope, no, there we go. We've got 100% voted. So we'll close this poll now and see what our results are. Okay, 66% um, of our audience believes that constipation does not improve over time, and then 33% says that they all improve over time. Okay, good. So um, the 66 that said that constipation doesn't improve over time would be the, the ones um, that are correct. So most of your side effects from opioids will improve over time. Constipation is the one that definitely does not. And so that's the one um, that I always encourage patients, if they know that their um, opioid needs are pretty constant, that it's important for them to try to figure out what type of bowel regimen works for them so that they don't get behind, because constipation can definitely be a problem. So, so good. All right, so now that we're more familiar with the opioids and the more common things to expect from them, I want to help walk through some of the differences between them. Um, this class includes a ton of different combinations of medicines that are marketed under a bunch of brand names. Um, so I've listed them here under their generic names just to keep it a little bit more simplified. So the first thing I want to do is orient you to the medications I've included. There are more medications than this in the opioid class, but I feel like these are the ones that are probably the most commonly prescribed and that you guys are seeing the most common um, for your patients. And so um, I also want to do honorable mention for codeine. This is a medication that actually has very little, if any, analgesia in its native form. 
Um, and the body coding is metabolized to morphine, which is why I've lumped it in with the morphine row. Um, however, there's really high variability with how well codeine is metabolized into morphine, meaning some people will metabolize codeine quite well, and those people will have really good analgesia from it, but others don't metabolize it well at all. And so for those patients, codeine doesn't work at all. Um, so because of this, codeine is usually um, or should be usually cautiously prescribed if it's prescribed at all for the treatment of pain unless it's being prescribed to you and you've had testing performed to determine how well you can metabolize it. Because the last thing you want to do is take a medication for pain and you're not even going to metabolize it into an active form that will work for you. Okay. The second column shows an idea of how these agents come or how they're formulated. Um, for some of the medications, they're um, are other formulations than the ones I've just listed here, but again, I'm trying to stick with the most common, so it's not too much information on the slide. It's already a lot. Um, so IR in this slide stands for immediate release. This is the most common way to see oral opioids prescribed. So your short-acting immediate release pills um, that are usually going to give you pain relief for three to six hours or so. Some of the formulations also have a controlled release formulation, or CR or a sustained release formulation, or SR, um, which is noted here. This is going to be your MS cotton or your oxycotton. If you think in the name of the word, the content within the name is short for continuous. So that will help you um, determine that these are long-acting continuous um, pain medications. Um, another thing to take into account for controlled or sustained release medications is that these medications are usually prescribed as tablets or capsules and typically cannot be crushed or formulated into a liquid without messing up the mechanism um, behind the controlled release. So this is something that's really important to continue to consider for our younger patients with hemophilia because if they're not able to swallow those tablets or capsules, then controlled release or sustained release products may not be the best for them. Okay, the third column shows how long it takes to start seeing effects. So this is really what you want to know as a mom, as a family member, or as a patient who's experiencing pain. How long is it going to take for this pain medicine to work? So there are small differences in the formulations, but in general, your IV formulations are going to start working the fastest. So those are typically going to get, give you pain relief within five minutes. After that, it's going to be your oral immediate release or short-acting formulations. So those are still going to take probably 30 minutes before you're going to start to see some relief. And that's going to be followed by your controlled release or your long-acting um, long medications. And those are going to take the longest to start working in the body. Of note, I did put on here the fentanyl patch. So I don't know how many patients with chronic pain from hemophilia are using the fentanyl patch. But there is a patch formulation of fentanyl. And that works by slowly releasing fentanyl into the subcutaneous tissue. But it takes 12 hours at minimum for enough fentanyl to make a depot in that tissue to start having an analgesic effect. So this is important because it's going to take at least 12 hours for that patch to start working. But when you take the patch off, it's also going to take that 12 to 18 hours for that um, fentanyl to be fully absorbed and to stop working. So it goes both ways. All right, peak medication effect is listed here. Um, this is probably less important than onset, but I put it there, um, and it's still kind of the same principle. So your IV medications are going to peak earliest, and then your immediate release, and then your sustained release or controlled release will take the longest. Um, another one I want to highlight is methadone. Methadone is a really interesting drug. Um, when it's first started in a patient, it does not last very long in the body. The half-life is very short, meaning it doesn't take very long for half of that drug to be eliminated from the body. However, if you take it continuously, the time that methadone is in the body increases drastically. And this varies quite largely from one person to another. So when you look at methadone, you can often see large ranges um, of time periods for methadones, whereas other drugs are more predictable. And then finally, I want to spend a second on duration of action, because this is something that can be really important for patients. So this should be a key consideration when determining what medication should be initiated. With the exception of methadone, all short-acting oral medications will have a duration of action of six hours or less. Your sustained release or controlled release medications, like your MS cotton or oxycontin, should last around 12 hours in the body, although younger children sometimes need to have them dosed more frequently because they clear the medication a little bit quicker. So sometimes you see them dosed as frequently as every eight hours. Um, so really, those long-acting medications should be lasting between eight and 12 hours. 
Um, your IV medications, again, are going to last the shortest period of time. Your fentanyl patch and your methadone, if you're taking methadone continuously, are going to last the longest amount of time. So this is something that I want to highlight because it's really important for hemophilia patients who have chronic pain and are in school. Um, if they need continuous pain relief throughout the day, it may be appropriate for them to look at a longer-acting oral medication so that they can take their opioid doses before school and after school without needing to have to worry about redosing in the middle of the school day. All right, I want to quickly discuss some terminology um, that comes up a lot when patients um, are talking to their physicians about these medications. And so we're going to talk about tolerance, physical dependence, and addiction. So tolerance occurs when decreasing effects are noted of a drug at a constant dose. So there is a need for higher dose of a drug to maintain the same effect. This is a physiologic response that is expected, and this is not addiction. This is something that occurs over time and is completely expected. Physical dependence is also a physiologic phenomenon manifested by the development of withdrawal if there is an abrupt discontinuation of therapy. Again, this is also not an addiction. This is a physiologic response. Addiction, the true definition of addiction, and I think this word gets used lightly, but the true definition of, of addiction is a neurobiologic disease, which is characterized by impaired control of the drug use and compulsive craving and drug use despite patient harm. So this is, again, a neurobiological disorder, a psychiatric disorder that leads to harm to the patient due to excessive cravings on the drug. Okay. I'm going to finish up by talking quickly about adjuvant therapies, and then Laura Jean's going to take over. So it's important to define adjuvant therapies because these can play a major role in comprehensive management of pain of hemophilia patients. Adjuvant means in addition to, and in pain management, it refers to the treatment of pain through therapies with different mechanisms of action than the primary therapy. So we have discussed at length the nociceptive or normal pain pathway here where the therapies we've talked about were attacking the nociceptive pain pathway in multiple areas. However, there's still other targets that can be included in our pain management strategy. So one of the most commonly utilized adjuvant pain medications is a pain medication called Neurontin. Neurontin is a medication that is commonly used in neuropathic pain, and it targets the GABA receptor. You may recognize the generic name for Neurontin, which is gabapentin. They're not very creative when they name these things, so they got that from the receptor um, that it targets. So as stated, this medication is a really good adjuvant to consider for neuropathic pain. Um, and neuropathic pain is a pain that's often qualified as a burning, pins and needles, numbness type of pain or feeling. And then another type of adjuvant medication that can be used for pain management are tricyclic antidepressants and SNRI antidepressants. And they have been FDA approved for pain syndrome and are also effective for neuropathic pain, similar to Neurontin. And this is independent of their effect on depression. So SNRI stands for serotonin norepinephrine reuptake, inhib reuptake inhibitor. And that works similarly to how the opioids block transmission of neurotransmitters across the nerve synapse, or that gap between the nerves, the SNRIs effectively block the uptake of serotonin and norepinephrine from that um, second neuron similarly. So these medications are often considered in patients who not only have neuropathic pain, but may also have a component of depression, although that does not have to be the case. And these also are going to target different parts of the pain pathway to give you a more complete treatment of your pain. So with that being said, and now that we've gone over the different medication classes that can be used to treat pain, I'm going to give it back to Sandy, who's going to tell us about non-medication management of pain, and she's going to then go over a couple of pieces. Okay. This is Sanja. I'm going to pause here for just a second and hand, hand the uh, screen over to Laura Jean. So you guys hang with us just for a second while we go through some technical Sorry. issues really quickly. And Laura Jean, if you just pull up that, that PowerPoint, you should be good to go. Okay, let's go to here. And we were on 19. Beautiful. All set? Thank you. Yep. All right, so now I'm going to talk about health tips for those in pain. 
So we need to remember that pain can be treated with or without, with and without drugs. So it's important that you set goals with your um, health care team. You need to decide what is a good pain goal for you. You know, if you look at a pain scale of 1 to 10 with 10 being your worst, you don't want a goal of like 5 or 6 because that's where you're tipping on the other half of the, the chart. So you want to figure out what, what can you tolerate and how to, is this pain changing your life. So how many, so some questions you might ask your healthcare team is how many times a day should you be taking your pain medicine? You need to remember there are no dumb questions. We want you to ask them. Feel free to call your hemophilia treatment center and ask your nurses anything. Some examples of things you might ask are, can I drive while taking this medication? What times of the day is it best to take my medication? How should I take the medicine? Are there any foods or drinks that you should not take while on these medications or any other considerations, such as can you take your pain meds with your other medications? What do you do if you forget to take a dose? And what are some of those side effects? So my first case study is a, a pediatric child. He's a four-year-old little boy. He has a, a target joint of that right ankle. This bleed is number four, the same ankle, in just two weeks. The preschool called mom at, at work to say that the patient's limping, he's crying, and he won't walk. They are unsure as to what happened and what to do. So the mother states they should apply ice and put his, ankle, his foot up on a chair, and she'll be right there to infuse him at school. As a hemophilia patient, the most important thing now is to get an infusion in right away. He's having an acute pain crisis. So since this patient is too young to infuse himself with his factor product, the mother knows that she must get to the school and do the infusion. She instructs the school on what to do when she, until she arrives. She is all set to infuse the patient at school because she has thought ahead and with her team has set up an emergency kit with a dose of factor to be kept at the school at all times. She will need to remember that tomorrow she needs to send another dose of factor so that there's always a dose of factor at the child's school. So next we're going to look at some misconceptions of children's pain. Some common concerns and facts about pain. Sometimes parents and people will say, hey, taking drugs for pain is a sign of weakness. However, the fact is untreated pain can decrease the quality of life or even harm health. No matter how strong a person is, less pain means less stress on the body and the mind and equals faster healing. Some people are afraid that their child will become addicted or hooked. But the fact is when pain medicines are given and taken in the right manner, patients rarely become addicted to them. And then also, sometimes parents will say, oh, yeah, my kid is doing fine. They're, they're sleeping and they don't complain. So he or she must not be feeling anything. Where in fact, what happens with children a lot of times is they want to shut out the pain so they actually will curl up and they go to sleep. So in reality, if they're sleeping more than normal, that's a key that something's not right. So first, let's look at a child's pain score. For children, we rely on you as parents and caregivers to help us determine the child's needs. So I might, you know, ask the child to relate to the pictures there, whether it has no hurt, they have no owie, or whether it's really, really bad. And children, even as young as three, can understand this face scale. Sometimes parents are worried about giving those um, narcotics to their children, but they should not suffer, but children should not suffer in pain. It stops them from being able to do what children do most, and that's learn and play. So then we have the FLAC scale. We use the FLAC scale for smaller children, sm younger than three years old. And what FLAC stands for is face, legs, activity, crying, and consolability. However, this scale relies on the caregiver or the nurse to look at the child and, and observe them and then rate the pain scale. So it's really important to be able to understand what all these um, numbers mean because if, if, if the child is rigid and holding themselves, you know, that sounds more like a four or six. So we have to add those up. But it's also, it's an interpretation of the pain behaviors because we really don't know 100%, but 
So we had to come up with some kind of a tool where we can look at them and just observe them and see if they're, you know, how, how bad their pain is. Now this here um, unique innovative device can help with such things as blood draws, labs, peripheral IV starts, even immunizations. This is Buzzy. Buzzy has little um, ice packs that we can put on the back of him. He can be used with or without ice. He is like a, he's got a little tourniquet, and so um, you can. Um, what he does is he vibrates when you put him on as the tourniquet. I've been able to use this at the hemophilia camp for the last two years in teaching kids the transitioning of, of port pokes to peripheral pokes. And some of the parents have even bought these. You can get more information about Buzzy by going to buzzy.com. You can also ask your hemophilia treatment center if they have a Buzzy. I use this with pediatric kids probably 90% of the time. And the other 10% I've actually started using it with adult patients. I recently had a young man. He was absolutely horrible needle phobic. And so I sat with him and his wife. We talked about Buzzy. I used Buzzy. And normally, he, when he has to have an IV start, he gets tachycardic. He has to have IV meds. He has to be put on a heart monitor. Using Buzzy, we eliminated all of that. And he swears he will never have a poke again the rest of his life without a Buzzy. So him and his wife actually bought one. Through, the, through a special nursing excellent grant awarded through the National Hemophilia Foundation, um, myself and Michelle Whitcock from the Munson Medical Center in Traverse City were given um, this grant to buy Buzzy kits and put together this packet for hemophilia treatment centers, which includes a Buzzy and a bunch of resources um, for hemophilia treatment centers. So if your center doesn't have one, tell them to get a hold of us. So the next is our acronym RICE. Pain takes more than a Band-Aid to fix and to treat. You may need to use multiple modalities or tools. As hemophilia families and pa uh, patients and families, we all should know that RICE is more than just eating. R stands for rest. OK, this is vital for keeping your arm or your leg from, ha from having more bleeding from being dangling, because that will make it worse. And remember, this mother at the preschool told the school to put his leg up on a chair and rest it. Then you have ice, ice to the area. And again, there's a lot of controversy over the ice. Um, so discuss it with your hemophilia treatment center team. Then there's compression. If this joint is, a, is problematic over a couple of days, we might add an ACE wrap to that to help support the ankle. And then elevation. For the first couple of days, we would elevate that area so that it, it doesn't continue to bleed and swell. Because the more it dangles from sitting, standing, or walking, the more it will bleed and the more increased pain um, you will have. So next, we're going to poll our audience. Up to you, Sanji. Yep, OK. I'm going to launch that poll right now. Okay. And the question is, is, how do you describe your pain with your healthcare team? Um, and select one of the following. You use a pain scale with numbers. You use a face scale. You use the flat scale. Or it is hard to describe at times. Um, so we'll give everybody a few minutes or a minute here to answer that question. And I have 100% already voting. So I'm going to close that poll. And let's see the results. We have 67% using a pain scale with numbers. And about a third of our audience says it's too hard to describe that time. And that makes a lot of sense, because a lot of times it's really hard for our patients to describe the difference between a bleed and um, chronic um, hemophili hemophilic um, arthritis. Our next case study is about an adult who has chronic pain. This is my 55-year-old young male who has hemophilia A severe, he's HIV positive, and hepatitis C positive. He's had years of hemophilic arthritis pain. He infuses himself one to two times weekly in PRN or as needed. He uses oxycodone. He gets 360 tabs a month, or that's what we wrote this script for. He gets two tablets every four to six hours around the clock. Plus, he gets that Celebrex twice daily. 
It becomes very anxious and upset with clinics, starts calling three to five days early for monthly refills, hangs up on the call center staff. He's very irritated. Sometimes he calls several times in one day when his refills are due. But the patient has had a long, light, lifelong issue with bleeding into his joints. Unfortunately, the patient shared with the nurse that he's having difficulty with the pharmacy. Nursing didn't know for the couple, last couple months, but they were refusing to fill his whole prescription. He became very irritated, hung up on staff, was screaming and yelling at our phone center. And so after, you know, this happened multiple days in a row, nursing talked to him, found out that he was having a lot of issues with his pharmacist. And so ultimately, nursing had to intervene and do a lot of education with the pharmacist had to be faxed. It took a half a day, really, of sending faxes back and forth and really um, talking to this pharmacist because he really, really did not want to dispense that much med each month. So the, pharma the nurse ha or myself had to fax over multiple information and educational materials about hemophilic arthritis. But this is partly because our state laws and insurance companies are starting to put tighter reins on the distribution of narcotics and the patients are only allowed so much each month. And these new regulations are being implemented for the safety of patients and families and hoping to prevent overusage of narcotics. However, with hemophilia patients, it's been proven they need more than the average joke. Since these laws and rules are new, it is taking both physicians and pharmacists as well as the patients time to get used to them and to understand them. Then the patient in the clinic worked out a great deal. He'll call once, remind us it's almost time. He'll give us time to um, do his refill, and we'll call him when we've mailed that prescription. And he can call as early as five days in advance, but he cannot call more than once in a day, and he cannot fill that prescription until the monthly due date. Also useful was to have a contract that states he cannot call after hours for the narcotics because most after hour staff who are not familiar with our team feel very uncomfortable prescribing narcotics for our patients. So it's really vitally important to remember to call during um, the hours of the clinic is open. So you should check with your hemophilia treatment center on the new laws and restrictions um, of class three or narcotics. In our state, there's also a program that, we can, that every time we fill a patient's narcotic prescription, we're supposed to go in and make sure that they have not gotten that from another um, physician. Because if so, then we have an obligation to report abuse. So let's see. We, we've looked at the different scales. We have the number scales. We have the face scales. Nurses and physicians rely on you, our patients, input either by using face scales or number scales or descriptions in order to understand what you're feeling as pain. It's totally because it's totally individual. And no one can feel what you're feeling. We do not. We do want to treat your pain issues. Patients have shared that it's sometimes really hard to decipher between arthritic pain and a bleeding episode. Treating with factor is rarely wrong. However, we do not want you to over-infuse, so it's really important that you call your hemophilia treatment center, discuss your signs and symptoms and the issues, because those will, we can help you decipher whether it's a true bleed versus um, your chronic pain issues. So here's where Erica and I were talking, or, or she was talking earlier about the pain diary and its benefits. You know that as a um, hemophilia patient, the importance of bleeding journals and log sheets. Well, this amazing tool can help caregivers understand when and what helps or what doesn't help you in regards to your pain. Get yourself a journal or a calendar and write on it. Include such things as your pain score. You know, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the worst ever, where is your pain and what time of the day is that? Include the date and um, if you used any medications. Include whether you've had any side effects, what makes it better, what makes it worse. As simple as all of this sounds, it provides us with vital information and how to, um, whether we need to go up on your meds, whether we need to add something else. And therefore, um, it's a tool that can be very beneficial at your clinic visit. So we're going to go to another poll. OK. And let me launch that one. 
And this question is, what types of things do you do to help decrease or distract you or your child from pain? And our options are pain diary, TV or music, rice, buzzy, or other. Give the audience a few seconds here to vote. Ten more seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And let's see what our results are. Um, we have about 50-50, 50-50 rice and 50% other. So um, might be curious to see what those others are. Audience members, if you want to type that into the question box, I can pass that along. That would be interesting to know what other things that they're doing. Rice is the number one um, thing that we really want them to do. Um, pain diary is something new that we're um, pushing. Um, distractional things like TV or music can be very helpful because it, it kind of gets your mind off of it. So, and Buzzy, again, is a new um, tool that we've just begun to use quite often. I don't have anything yet, Largene. I, I know for my son, you know, electronics, anything electronic, texting, computer, video yeah, games. Yeah, that, that, that goes in with the TV and the music. It's anything that will dis distract them. So, and we do have, like, Game Boys and little laptops um, or tablets in the um, clinical area for the kids to play games with. So those yeah. are good. So it would be not, interesting. Not if those are the other that people are using. Yeah, I'm not getting any response from the audience right now, but um, okay. I, I, can, I can tell you from personal experience, those electronics, if it has a plug, it works. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree, or batteries, right? Okay, ouch, it still hurts. What should I do now? So if your pain meds are not working, it's vitally important that you call your nurse or doctor and let us know, because we can't tell what you're feeling. However, we must rely on your description, but we're going to ask you a lot of questions, and sometimes they might be redundant, but we have to document, you know, your responses and, and stuff to all these questions. So we're going to ask you things like, when was the last time you took your meds, and how much did you take? Are you following the prescribed plan? Did you sway or do something different? What helps? What doesn't help? What is your pain score on that scale of 1 to 10? Um, and what is the worst thing to do? So the, one of the worst things to do is to sit on that pain and then panic after hours because you got to remember those off-hour people who don't know you are not going to want to order the narcotics. And so a lot of times you have to end up going to the emergency room. So know your clinic's policies on narcotics and do you have to sign a contract? So what else can you do? All right, we've got Buzzy for Pokes. You can do warm baths and soaks. You can do ice packs, remembering that there's a controversy over ice packs now. Deep breathing, there's a reason why deep breathing is a great distractional tool. Women have been doing it for centuries in order to give birth. Self-hypnosis is good. Music therapy. Acupuncture is now proven to be um, okay for hemophilia patients. Gentle massage. Now, Massage is good, just make sure it's not deep. Any kind of distraction, like TV, reading a book, electronics, playing a game. I even had one mother that used to sing the ABC song to her child every time he was getting a poke. We got to know every rendition there was, but it worked. So it's, it's what works for you might not work for the next person, but be willing to try new things. So before we go to the questions, just to end the program with some thoughts, I want you to remember to be aware that when you call your nurses, you, we are going to ask a lot of questions. And that only helps us staff to understand what you have tried and to help decipher between whether you're having a bleeding issue or a pain issue. If your pain meds are not working, please, please call your nurse or your doctor and let us know. We must rely on your description. Other, you know, and then again, it's back to those questions we're going to ask you. When was the last time you took your medicine? How much did you take? Are you following the prescribed plan? The, um, you know, remember that pain puts too much stress on your body. So call during clinic hours. 
and know your hemophilia treatment center's policies and rules. And now we're going to take any questions you might have. Um, and if there are none, we wish you all a happy holiday. Thank so you, do we have any questions America. from the audience? Yeah, there was one earlier, and I'm going to kind of summarize it. Um, one of our attendees used opioids, morphine, and many more pain relievers for almost five years. Um, it led to abuse for him, and um, he said that he would like to, he, he assumes that many patients would like to find a solution to quit, since it's really hard to quit cold turkey. Um, he went on to say that he has been clean for eight months and is using, and Ladies, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, Zubzolv, um, cool. and says that this has saved his life and his treatment center agrees with that. Um, and he just wanted to kind of share that, that antidote so that people um, know that there is a solution um, and some options out there uh, and, and know that he, he found an, an answer for, to his pain with some uh, safe and clean treatment. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's a really, really interesting story, and um, and we're congratulations on being clean for eight months. That's that's wonderful, wonderful news. I I don't know, CBA, are you, are, I don't know why I keep calling you CBA. Laura Jean, are you familiar with that medication? I am no, not. Of it. No, I am How not. How do you spell it? Um, let me go back and look. Hold on. Okay, because I couldn't see that question. Yeah, it's. So it, he's, he spelled it as Z-U-B-S-O-L-V. Z-U-B? Z-U-B-S-O-L-V. I don't know that one at all. I don't either, but... Um, well, look it up. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. We c yeah, if, if you guys want to look it up, I can certainly um, contact this attendee on, on the back end for sure. Yeah, I don't know much about that medication. I know that, I mean, definitely with chronic pain, um, for any reason, whether it's for hemophilia or for, you know, for any reason, patients that may be on opioids for a long period of time, um, definitely all degrees of those three words that we talked about, so um, tolerance, physical or physiologic dependence, and addiction, all degrees of those can occur. Um, and then depending on how long you've been on the opioids, what opioids you've been on, what symptoms you're having if you're trying to come off of them, you know, with your treatment would be different. Um, but there are right. wonderful treatment centers here, and it sounds like this medication has been very helpful for, for this audience member. And, um, and I'm happy to look into it, and if he has more questions, you know, to talk. But okay. I'm very, very thankful for him to share that story. Okay, thank you. Um, we, had, we had a question about what the controversy is over ICE. And, and using that. So, uh, Laura Jean, if you'd like to share a little bit more about that. Yeah, some, we're still using ice at our center, but some people feel that when you put the ice on, it does stop the bleeding, but then when you take it off, sometimes it increases bleeding. But we don't have any real strong evidence-based um, information on whether that's true or not. Some physical therapists think it is true, and some say no, that's, you know, so it's, it, 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 we're leaving it up to the hemophilia treatment centers, but right now nationally we're still using ice. It, it's very much like other things in hemophilia. It's, it's not a one-size-fits-all treatment. Right. Huh? And, yeah. right. And, and it might work on some and not on others, but, you know, so. And then we also had a question about does your tolerance get higher um, the longer you use a medication. Um, so does is, does that help lead to uh, a, a addiction or a, uh, a dependence issue? Um, I wouldn't necessarily, this is Erica, so I'm going to take a stab at that. It's going to depend on the medication. So not all medications will necessarily lead to tolerance. Um, but again, tolerance is going to be more where the dose that you're currently taking um, produces less of an effect than it used to. And so in the medications that can do this, and the opioid medications absolutely can produce tolerance. Um, definitely the longer you're on it, then you definitely run the risk. It's a physiologic phenomenon based off of how those opioids block those receptors and block the transmission of neurotransmitters. Um, over time, your body can compensate for that mechanism. 
And so then over time, it's gonna, your body can make more receptors and more neurotransmitters, and then that same dose of opioid isn't gonna be able to block all of the new receptors and new neurotransmitters that your body made. And so um, definitely over time, you can see that what dose is to work for you may not work as well any longer. And so you do sometimes see patients need to have increases in dose over time because they're not feeling like they get the same pain relief. But that doesn't necessarily lead to, lead to addiction. It just is a, is a physiologic response in the body. Okay. Very good. Um, well, I don't see any more questions in our question box right now, um, but we'll, we'll leave that open here for another minute while I uh, point out a couple of things that HFA has to offer. Um, and I don't have a slide on this, but number one, we have an app on um, Apple products and Android products called Get In Gear. And um, it's primarily a fitness app where you can track your, uh, your physical activity, but there is a pain log on there. Um, so if, if anyone's interested in using that, it's a free app. Um, I can speak from experience that using it definitely kept me on track uh, when, when I was doing some physical activity and trying to stay in shape, I need to get back on that. Um, but definitely check that out. Um, also, for any parents or, or even older patients who are on the line who have had issues with needle phobia um, and, and phobia around procedures, we had a webinar earlier this year called Tackling Pain and Anxiety um, that was also done by some nurses at the University of Michigan. And it was a really great webinar, gave a lot of good advice. Um, and so that is on our YouTube channel. If you just search Hemophilia Federation of America on YouTube um, and then look for Tackling Pain and Anxiety, you can find that recorded webinar. Um, tonight's webinar is also be re being recorded. So if at any point you want to go back and listen to it, it will be up on YouTube probably within the week. Um, the, the last thing is that We've instituted uh, these toolkits over the last year at HFA that are kind of this uh, one-stop shopping for resources on a particular topic. Uh, and we are going to be releasing a toolkit all about pain uh, here in the next week. So be on the lookout for that. Um, like us on Facebook. That is the easiest and quickest way to find uh, resources from the Hemophilia Federation of America. You can always look on our website at hemophiliafed.org too. Um, but both of these webinars will be uh, in that toolkit as well as, well as resources to other, uh, a variety of other sources uh, in the community. Um, but this slide right here uh, really quickly is about our Mo My Choice, My Voice project. Um, and this is a project that we are doing in collaboration with the Centers for Disease, Disease Control. Um, where we're really looking for patient information um, and how their experience has been with their bleeding disorder, um, how they were diagnosed, what their bleeding history is, their insurance coverage, uh, how, how their activity is, their ability to attend school. And what we're trying to do is really get an idea of how many patients are out there in the bleeding disorders community. Um, there was a study many years ago that said up to a third of bleeding disorders patients are not seen in hemophilia treatment centers. And when we go to Washington to advocate, we don't always know our exact numbers and how many people we have in our community. Uh, so this project has really helped us find some of those people and, um, and really get those stories out to, to a variety of people. Um, all that information is de-identified, um, very utmost security. Um, and we're definitely looking for people who are seen at a hemophilia treatment center and who are not seen at a hemophilia treatment center. And Laura Jean, I believe you still have um, a slide, so if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the last thing I want to mention is our annual symposium is coming up March 26th through 28th uh, next year in St. Louis, Missouri. And we hope to see many of you there. Uh, we do have scholarships for first-time attendees where we can help pay a portion of your cost to get to the meeting. Um, and that will also, that information will be on our website very soon within the month. Um, so be able to look out for that. It's a great weekend of education. Um, it's been referred to as a family reunion of sorts. 
uh, we have a really good time and a lot of good interaction and community building at our symposium. So I hope to see you there. Um, and I'm looking, I don't see any more questions, ladies. So I think with that, we can wrap it up. Um, I want to say thank you to, to both Erica and Laura Jean uh, for an excellent presentation tonight. I definitely learned something. And um, as, as I speak, have a child in pain upstairs. So uh, appreciate having some input and um, insight on how to help manage that. Um, and thank you to Michelle for helping me out on the back end tonight, too. Um, and thank you to all of our participants. We know that this is a tough time tonight, and we appreciate you guys uh, calling in and listening in to this presentation. So with that, good night, happy holidays, and thank you to you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.